Let's put a little SEO juice into your website. You're a voice actor. You're an entrepreneur. You're a VOpreneur. Welcome to the Everyday VOpreneur Podcast, your guide through the business of voiceover. Having your voiceover demos easily playable and downloadable on your website is essential. The Voice Sam Player lets you do that across any device and browser. There are also options for adding play buttons in your email signature, tracking your listens, and even putting videos in your demo player. Sign up now at voicesam.com slash markscott and receive an instant $25 credit. For full details and to claim this offer, visit voicesam.com slash markscott. The Veopreneur Podcast. Hey, it doesn't suck. Not as funny as Conan. Not as cute as Seth Meyers. Not as smart as Colbert. But he's one of us, and that counts for something. Here's Mark Scott, the original everyday Veopreneur. Hello and welcome to the Everyday Veopreneur Podcast, your guide through the business of voiceover. I'm Mark Scott, the original everyday Veopreneur. Got another great one for you today, talking about SEO. This is one of those topics that Honestly, it makes my brain hurt, and as you listen to the interview, you will get a sense of how much SEO makes my brain hurt, but it is also one of those things that I know can make a huge difference in your website if you can figure out even some of the basic tips and tricks to improve your SEO, and that is exactly what we're going to help you do. Now, just before we dive into this week's episode, one quick favor to ask, are you enjoying the podcast? Would you do me a favor? Would you head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening and leave a five-star review? Let people know that you're enjoying the interview series. Let them know that you're learning and let them know how much you enjoy the Everyday Veopreneur podcast. Also, while you're listening, tag me on Instagram at Mark Scott. You can throw it in your Instagram stories. Let me know that you're listening and I'll share it as well. Would love to hear from you. So my guest today is going to help you with your SEO writing. Now, just to be clear, that does not mean that we all have to go out and start blogs, although that is certainly one of the options that is available to us. But I think you're going to be surprised at All of the little things that you can do, even to a basic website, to help improve your SEO and get a little extra love from the Google bots and the algorithms and all of the other technology that is out there. Enjoy this interview. An SEO-rich website that ranks high in Google and brings regular work through the door simply because it appears high in multiple searches is, of course, the dream, but it is one that is not easily attained. It requires a great deal of effort, often a significant investment. Unless you happen to be an expert SEO writer, which most of us are not. However, it just so happens that there is one voice actor in our midst who is an expert on the subject, and she has some tips that she is willing to share. Welcome to the Everyday Veopreneur podcast, Lynn Norris. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. So I was told by a mutual friend that right out of the gate, I needed to ask you about the Hamptons. The Hamptons? I was told that there's a goal there. In the ha- oh no, it's uh, it's actually Cape Cod, not Cape. The Hamptons. Okay, she told me Hamptons, but it's actually <laughs> Cape Cod. All right, right. well, well t- tell me what the Cape Cod goal is. I'm I have lived for a very long time in the New York area. I'm in Hoboken, which I just call Manhattan West. It's literally out straight across the Hudson River from Manhattan. But I've lived in the concrete jungle for a super long time, and uh, I want trees. Yes. I know that I'm asking for a house, which, you know, is great, but also has a whole set of maintenance issues. But I want trees and wind and quiet and not to share a couple walls with neighbors who renovate and things like that. I understand. You know what? My wife and I went to Cape Cod several years ago. We we went kind of for an anniversary trip. We took our bikes and we rode like 65 or 68 kilometers or something like that in a, in a single day, which I don't know right. what that means. 45 <laughs> miles or something. I don't even know. But the bicycle paths around Cape Cod, you could literally ride all the way around right. all of Cape Cod on your bike on the most amazing trails. And we had so much fun. It was a really great weekend. So I can totally understand why you would want to end up there. Yeah. My friends have a home there and I go to visit and it's not even to visit them. <laughs> There's some pretty good seafood on uh, Cape Cod as well. I recall eating my fair share of lobster while I was out there for a couple of days. So Yes. Nice. It's all great, yeah. All right, so let's talk SEO because I know that that's what people have a lot of questions about. And and I I think we're going to learn a lot here, so I'm excited for this. Now, SEO writing and creative writing 
are two different things. And, and I kind of touched on this a little bit when I interviewed Paul Strickwerda recently, and he was talking more about the blogging and, and creative side of things. But right. help us understand the difference between SEO writing and creative writing. And can creative writing still help with SEO? Yes, to, <laughs> definitely. So the way that I look at it is that what I do and help people do is writing content for your website. So you want to think of it not just as, well, gosh, I don't know any of the SEO rules, so I'm just going to sit down and pump out a couple of paragraphs about who I am. It all started in the fourth grade when Lynn was in the wiggle worm, you know, or content writing where it's just where now we even think like, gosh, we have to write blog, you know, short mini blogs like Paul does on our Instagram page and then transfer those to the website. So creative writing can be uh, super great for your website. And if you blend in the SEO, so I kind of try to think about it like that, that we're writing creative content with the SEO rules blended in. Okay. So we're not SEO scientists, certainly. I am not anyway. But you still want to write for two primary audiences, the humans that are going to read your page, but also the computers that are going to organize all the data on your website. And uh, the only way they can do that is by reading words. So you have to write for two audiences, but you can blend the two together nicely, I think. And is it is it fair to say that one of the easiest ways to do that is to just think about, if I was going to Google something, how would I Google it? Which is usually in the form of a question, right? Like, generally speaking, now when we search things up, we're searching for, we're, we're typing questions into Google. So if we can incorporate an element of that into the writing, is, is that kind of the easiest way to do it? Or is that too broad of a, a statement? Well, the way that I uh, work with people is to say, okay, first of all, you, you're not sitting down to write, you know, call me Ishmael. You are sitting down first to plan out what you want to say. And so think back to your five paragraph essay plans in English class and then make it fun. Certainly not terrible like English class may have been for some, but it's a structure. So you're going to need to think about first, OK, what what's the page about? So if that's about a particular genre, let's say it's about explainer videos. So this particular page is about explainer videos. So what do I want to say about it? Well, that's when, to your point, you think about, well, what are people looking for? You never just want to write from the perspective of, this is who I am. This is what I bring to the table. Hope that helps. You want to be thinking about, here's how I can help you. I mean, lots of people, you talk about this all the time. Uh, so do other marketing teachers of like, it's not about you. It's yeah. about them. Mm -hmm. But you want to talk to them from their perspective, uh, even if you're talking about yourself, it's it's relatable. So if if you imagine the question is, how can I get voiceover quickly? Then even if you tell a story about how, you know, at 7 p.m. on a Friday night, a client reached out to you in a panic and you were able to return it by 9 p.m. so that everybody could enjoy the weekend. You're telling a story about how you responded quickly, but it's in relation to the question they asked. So you can think about creative ways to, instead of just saying, I deliver quickly. And that's great, and that's a fact, but it's not very interesting. Expand on the thought. Right. Okay, so, I mean, part of this then is just paying close attention to the questions that your clients and your, your uh, potential clients are asking you on a regular basis, because if there's a question that they're asking... Chances are other people are thinking or asking that same question. So there's an opportunity to potentially create some content for your website out of those sure. questions. Sure. Um, so what it's not taught a lot when we talk about, I mean, marketing in voiceover. There are some really great teachers. Obviously, you are one of them. Uh, there are a couple of others that do to do a really good job. So I'm not this is not a teardown of any voiceover marketing teachers. But marketing uh, teachers outside of the VO world start with the perfect avatar. Mm -hmm. Usually it's for like an e-commerce course, and they, and they really go into detail about that perfect avatar. Now, that's, it's not that that's not touched on in voiceover either, but the perfect avatar, you know, how old are they? Where do they live? How much money do they make? I mean, some of those questions are more geared to if you're trying to sell them, I don't know 
uh, face cream. But uh, but it can also work for, okay, so my perfect avatar for explainer video is the production video uh, house. So the production company, the explainer video company, even more specifically, who's that one person there? But then what are the questions they have? I've taken courses in the voiceover space where we, we do talk about like, uh, what are their pain points of a video producer? But if you've never been a video producer, I'm not sure you always know what yep. all the pain points are. We know some of them. Some of them are obvious. They want professional voiceover. They want it quickly and accurately. They don't want to waste any time. We know th that's obvious. But maybe there are some other questions, like maybe they're trying to grow their business. So how is what I can provide going to help them provide for their clients and grow their business? Maybe there's some underlying human needs that you can kind of just be imagining and making up for that one client. And then write just to one person. You're only answering that one avatar's questions. And I, I think that's key. And I mean, I do in Playbook, I dive into the ideal customer avatar. And one of the reasons why right. I do that is because the, the, the content that's going to speak to an instructional designer is going to be very different from the content that's going to speak to an audiobook publisher or, you know, even in the, you know, the, the content that speaks to a, a commercial producer is going to be different than what speaks to a, a corporate video producer or whatever. And so when you when you really do take the time to drill down and kind of figure out who your audience is, it certainly helps go a long way in, in trying to make sure that you're writing the content that is going to be suited for them. And then I think surveying can be a really great way as well. Don't be afraid to ask your clients, you know, like what are what are the top five issues that you're dealing with right now? I, I've done that before. Uh, and and usually people are more than happy to talk about some of the problems that they're dealing with just out of sheer hope that somebody might actually have an answer for them. Absolutely. It's a skill set where you need to start listening mm -hmm. to what your clients say just in conversation. Yeah. So not in interview necessarily, although that's a really fantastic idea to just straight up ask, hey, quick question, uh, if I were to survey you about your top five issues, what are they when it comes to voiceover specifically? They might say, I'm so sick of hearing people record on their phone or yep. gosh, I wish people would take all the breaths out of their e-learning before they give it to me. Maybe not. Maybe I gosh, it's really weird when everybody takes the breaths out of everything. <laughs> you like, can't Are win. you guys not breathing? No, of course. But anyway, you get you get some really good answers that are specific to what to do as a voiceover artist, but maybe those answers aren't going to help you in copy. So you have to, you know, I can de-breath or not de-breath, whatever you'd like. Maybe you could you could use that as a creative line in your copy, but most people aren't going to understand what that means. So you have to be looking for things that are understandable to the most iterations of that yeah. avatar. Yep. Trying to make the content, broadly speaking, unless, of course, you are planning on specifically drilling down. The, the, this is content that's going on my e-learning section. This is content that's going on my corporate narration section or whatever. But Right. I do, I do very much advocate for that though if yep. you're making genre pages then you want that genre page to be all about that genre and yes you can talk about yourself and your general skills and the general qualities of your voice or the descriptors that you've decided the keywords that you use to describe your own talents but you want to make sure that the copy that you're writing on an explainer video page addresses the explainer video world so that you're talking and relating to that particular uh, buyer. You want to be known, uh, liked, and trusted, right? Yep. Uh, so you want to make sure that they know that you know what they're going through. This brings up another question that I think fits then. Uh, recently, I did a Google search, and I literally went into Google, and I typed, when will Ghostbusters Afterlife release on digital, right? I'm not ready okay. to go to the theater yet, but I really right. want to see the movie. <laughs> and it took me to a site that had thousands of words of coffee, most of which were variations of the question that I had typed into Google. I, I never did get my answer, but it was just like literally I'm reading through it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, somebody literally just built this page to sell ads. That's that's literally what they did it for. Right. Can we overdo it? Like when we're getting genre specific and we're trying to write and we're trying to create 
SEO for whether it's corporate narration or animation or e-learning or whatever it is that we specialize in. Can we overdo it with the SEO with with keywords and key phrases? Like, does there come a point where the Google bots get angry with us? I'm not knowledgeable enough about the exact specifics in the algorithm to know, you know, when you've used the word explainer video four times on a page, suddenly that throws up a flag for the computers. I don't know what that algorithm is and likely it changes. But yes, absolutely. It's called keyword stuffing. So, for instance, a sentence that says Lynn Norris is an American voice actor with a voice that is youthful and yet authentic and She can deliver your voiceover, all one word, quickly. There's a a lot of the word voice in that sentence. Right. So you can really stuff uh, reading. And a a human, so remember those two audiences, right, humans and computers, you have to write for humans too. Because one key piece of SEO that I'll throw in here is that you want to write for humans so that they'll stay on your page because time on page is an SEO feature. So if you write and someone can scan your page in three seconds and go, oh, yeah, no, and move away from your page, I'm not reading that. That's too many words and none of them are interesting in the first couple sentences, so bye. Then Google thinks, oh, that page is not relevant to the search or less relevant to the search. So you want humans to stay. So you can't just stuff it full of keywords or write a whole bunch of keywords on a white website in white text and hope that all those keywords will register with the computer, but no human will see it. Don't do that either. Okay, that's actually good because that was one of the questions that I had written down because (laughs) uh, it's something that I've heard that people do, right? They, They write content that is exclusively for the purposes of SEO. So whether it's just a whole bunch of variations of a question, kind of like the Ghostbusters page or, you know, stuffed with certain keywords or key phrases like you talked about, right. but then they're kind of buried. What You know, they, they hide them, whether it's, you know, white text on a white page or whatever. Right. And teeny, I wonder, tiny font down in the corner. Yeah, and, and I was Make curious. it look like a hashtag list. Probably the hashtag list would be the least embarrassing were your white uh, screen to suddenly be beige and your white font to be white on a particular computer screen and suddenly now I can see your entire keyword list. Right. So not every white is the same white. So remember that if you're hiding things, not every black is the same black. If you're hiding keywords just by using colors, not every device renders those colors the same way. So remember that. Is there value to that then? Or is that something that would work if you did it if you wrote an article that was written for humans, right? but then at the bottom of the page, you wrote a bunch of copy keywords, keywords. key phrases that is for the, the robots, sure. and you buried those and hid those, in that application, that would work. But if you were just doing the, the SEO writing and hiding it all, you're not right. going to get the time on page, so then that's not going to work. Is that, is that right? Yes, like Karen Barth said in hers, it depends because not every list of keywords is going to help you anyway. If you're using keywords like, I don't know, uh, scientist, doctor, uh, nurse for a medical page, and someone's typing in medical voiceover, none of those keywords are related to that search. So they're not going to help you anyway. So it depends on the keywords you're using. What I would say is if you're writing an article or a blog post and you want to make sure that the keywords are visible, maybe make them a very small list at the bottom and just acknowledge that's what you're doing. Like, here are some of the terms you're going to find inside my article. Okay. Terms. Just so that humans don't go, ah, oh, come on. Like, you didn't write this for me. Now right. I don't trust you. Yeah. I know I knew you and I liked you and I got to the bottom of it and I saw your keyword list and now I don't trust you. Very so, interesting. I mean... SEO scientists would know better whether that specifically helps you for SEO. But remember that there's two audiences here and you want people to know, like, and trust you as a human, whether your website ranks highly or not. They have found you and they are on your site. And now you want to make sure that they want to hire you instead of thinking, oh, this person only cares about making sure everyone sees them. The more that we get into this and and having talked with Karen about it, you know, we we mentioned that I did an interview with Karen. 
And now hearing what you have to say, the more that I get into this subject, the more I realize why I have no desire to figure out any of this stuff and why I just want to have somebody do it for me because there are so many rules to understand. There are so many things to take into consideration. Absolutely. Well, the good the good part about that, think about it this way, is that you're writing content sprinkled with stuff that will help your website move up in the search engine stuff and try not to be like, an SEO expert about it. You're not, you're never going to beat those websites with a big budget that pay lots of money for Google ads and or millions of dollars in SEO every year. You're never going to beat them as a small voiceover business. So don't try. Relax. I, it actually, it did blow my mind when Karen said that there are people that are paying like thousands of dollars a month to get yeah. SEO. And I was like, yeah, that 90% of us, 98 99 percent exactly. of us can't afford to do that so absolutely there are but there are little things that we can do along the way that can certainly come into play and help in this episode you heard lynn and i talk about your ideal customer avatar trying to figure out who is the type of voiceover client that you love to work with and that you want to build your business with and how do you go out and find more of those that is one of the things that i teach in voiceover marketing playbook I want to teach you how to direct market your voiceover business so that you don't have to stress over SEO, but you can use SEO as a supplemental tool. So we're not just sitting back and waiting for work to come walking through the door all the time. We're going out, we're actively finding and marketing ourselves to new voiceover leads, but maybe working on some SEO stuff so that your website's working for you in the background as well. If you need help with direct marketing, if you don't know where to find leads, if you don't know what to say when you do find them, if you don't understand how to use tools like email marketing and social media to stay in touch with these leads and ultimately convert them to clients, these are all of the things that you're going to learn in VoiceOver Marketing Playbook. Direct marketing is how I have built my entire voiceover business, and I want to give you all my secrets. Playbook is out January 5th to 14th, 2022. Again, that's January 5th to 14th, 2022, and you can find all the details on it at voiceovermarketingplaybook.com. That's voiceovermarketingplaybook.com. Now, back to our show. So if we're writing for SEO and we want to try to make some sort of a difference in a search engine like Google, right? is there a minimum standard for how much content we need, how often we need to be adding content, how many characters we need to have in a blog or an article? Like, Are there some basic rules that kind of come into play? I think the sweet spot now is something like 800 words to 1,200 words. And I believe, Karen could probably correct me if this is incorrect, but I believe that it doesn't matter. Google's not going to go, oh, this is a genre page versus, oh, this is a blog entry page. Google's just going to read words. So the more words you give Google, the better. Okay. Now, my own personal website, because I started writing website copy with my own, breaks a lot of those rules. Some pages are longer than others. I'm working slowly on making that better uh, and have adding more content that's relevant, et cetera. But I think the sweet spot now is somewhere between 800 and 1,200 words. And that is a lot of words, trust yeah. me. You start to write them and you think, oh, wow, I've written for pages. And you do a word count and it's 423. And you're like, what? <laughs> that makes no sense. Uh, so it's a lot to write. And here's another catch to that writing is that 80% of it on every page, about 80, should probably be unique. So don't say the same thing over and over again. Oh, I've got four paragraphs I love that are about me and my business, and I'm going to use them on every single page. That's good for humans. They're like, oh, okay, well, I've already read this before. So it slows down your time on page because they're going to check it out. But the next page will be quicker because they've already read that. They're like, oh, that's words I've already read. Next. But it also hurts your SEO because the, the more places you use the same exact words, so on your website, on different pages, on other websites like rosters, etc., if you're using all the same blurbs that you love because they're great, but you're using the exact same ones everywhere, that tends to hurt your SEO rather than help your SEO. So you need to be finding new and interesting ways. How can I rephrase this phrase uh, over and over again? That's a really good point. So you're saying if I've written a, a bio, like a, a short bio, a four, six sentence bio, 
that I'm using, and that is what I post on on all of my casting site profiles, and I share that in my LinkedIn profile, and I don't know, do people still have an About Me page? You, you create an About Me page, whatever it is, you're saying if you're using that exact same blurb over and over and over again, that it can it can actually hurt you. So we think we're saving time because we wrote a really smart bio, but right. the more we copy and paste, the, the worse that it actually is for us. Uh, yes, it can be. Okay. Now, nothing, remember, it like depends. Karen said, Everything. Not, it depends. Right? nothing is a hard and fast rule. So the other, always keep in mind these two audiences. So even with uh, pay to play audiences, those are still humans. If you have a really good blurb and no time, and you want to put that on a pay to play, and you want to put it on five, put it on five, but put on your to do list that you're going to go back to four of them and rewrite some of it. Not all of it doesn't have to be 100% different, but try to shoot for 80% different if you can. Okay. So I'm assuming the same would apply for blogs. So if you wrote a if you wrote a really great blog post and then you decided that you wanted to share that as an article on LinkedIn, if you copy and paste the the blog post into an article on LinkedIn, same thing. It it could potentially hurt you. You got to rewrite 80% of it or flip the flip I think the words. for blogs it's a little different. It well, I'm I'm not an expert on whether posting an exact copy of it on LinkedIn hurts you, but having an article or a blog post somewhere else that then links the reader back to your website is actually really good for SEO. Right. That's called a backlink. Yep. So in the case of a blog, whether that's 100, you know, 100% different or 80% different, I wouldn't know the answer to that one. But I do know that for small bios... If the 100% of the tiny bio on a pay-to-play is exactly the same as a small paragraph on your bigger website, that then those should be 80% different if you okay. can. Okay. So, 80%, that's a, that's a generalized rule. General rule, right. Yeah. And you can break every single rule and no one dies. Remember that. Yes. <laughs> At the end of the day, unless you're willing to spend thousands of dollars... Most of the efforts that we're putting in are going to make a minimal difference at best, I'm I'm assuming. But if you know some basic things that you can do, it's it's best practices, right? Like, let's right. do at least the basic stuff that we can do so that over time, you know, especially if you're writing a blog or you're consistently adding new content to your website, over time, it, it starts to make a difference. So we were talking a little yep. bit about biographies then. So Mark wants to know if he should be writing his biography in the first or third person. Great question. That is completely up to Mark. Here's a there's a uh, lot of it depends in <laughs> SEO. <laughs> there really is. Uh, it's a creative space, right? So the same with how should I read an explainer video? How should I voice one? It's the exact same kind of well. That depends. Yeah. What is the buyer looking for? Um, what I would say about bios and and copy in general is that when I started writing copy for other people, I was doing it with. Joe and Karen and helping in, as part of their team, uh, adjunct part of their team. And so I got a lot of great training from them and their recommendation is third person. I understand that completely. It is very hard for small business solopreneurs to sit down and say, Lynn is the best explainer video voice you will ever need. You know, that's, we feel gross about that. Yep. It feels very braggy. Most of us were brought up to be extremely polite never say a good word about ourselves. We also are performers. We tend to be super self-deprecating. Yes. Uh, so it's very hard to break out of that to say all the good things about yourself in first person. So third person is an easier way to pretend that the business, voiced by Lynn Business, is presenting Lynn Norris, the narrator, who just happens to work for voiced by Lynn Business, is presenting her in third person. That holds true very much for other rosters. Lynn, on the Voice123 roster or on an uh, e-learning narrator's roster, uh, you want those bios to be in third person. That's a totally valid point. Something I hadn't thought of before, but yeah. Because on, they're presenting you. They're yeah. introducing you. Yeah, that's smart. So you want those to be. Whether or not your website is in first person or third person is a personal preference, I believe. Uh, most of what I write is in third, but I have written some in first. It's harder for someone to help you and write in first uh, right. for you, write for you. Yes. They can, I can guide you in writing about yourself for sure, but you have to do the writing. 
because it needs to be in your voice. Yep. And that's something that I would say very much about blogs, just to segue there for a second. I have had people ask me to help them or write for them blog entries, but they've never written a blog before. It's really kind of impossible to hire a ghostwriter. I mean, lots of people do it. <laughs> Certainly the art of the deal might be one of them. But if you've never written anything before in your life, to ask somebody to write and then write as if they were you, it's going to be them. Yep. So now you have to pretend that that's your voice instead of writing in your voice. Yeah. So if you want a blog and you've never written a blog before and you're not sure and you're like, ah, what I'm what I will write would be terrible. Please write it for me. My advice is no, write it yourself and then hire the person to help you make it better so that it's in your voice. So that then it's unique to you. People will know, like, and trust you. You're doing it for your website to increase words that Google, Google can read because Google likes to read. And quite frankly, that's the main and only thing it does. So in order to organize your website, the more copy you have, the better. So Paul Stridworka will never have a competitor. Yeah, he will never. <laughs> there, yeah, we got a, anybody that wants to compete with that has a long way to go. And needs a time machine to do it. Yes. And needs to write thousands of entries. But it's such a slow build that after 15 years and hundreds and hundreds of entries, he has a website that Google is loves yep. and reads and organizes. So if you're not Paul, which most of us are not, then you're, you want to write blog entries that someone will want to read and stay on your page to read it. So you want to make sure that it's in your voice so that when they're done, they feel like they know, like, and trust you a little bit better. I'm, I'm really sensing a theme with the know, like, and trust. Yes. And, I, and I totally see, I mean, I get it, right? I mean, that's why we, when we go on Amazon before we buy something, we read the reviews because we wanted we want to know whether or not this thing is is good or how other people feel about it. And absolutely, I mean, your testimonials on your website are are part of what gives people that sense of who you are and the type of work that you do. But I totally get how what you write, what you say, and and, and how you build the content around your website. It helps paint a better picture of who you are and, and gives them a sense of whether they're going to know, like, and trust you. So, I, I mean, that, right. that all makes sense to me. Yeah. Writing web writing website copy is not writing a book. Even as creative as it is, you are, it has to be planned out. You need to know what you're going to say. You need to structure. What are you going to lead with? What are you going to follow up with? Uh, what's a better entry? Karen was talking on your podcast about things that are further up the page having more value, yep. being more important. Mm -hmm. Same is true within a paragraph. Okay. So you want to lead with, uh, for instance, if my sentence is, I truly and strongly believe that everyone deserves to be healthy. Get rid of, I truly strongly believe that, because the strongest position is at the beginning. Everyone deserves to be healthy, period. This is something that I've been learning because I've been trying to get better with my YouTube channel. I've got so much content on YouTube, but for so many years, I was literally just throwing videos up and I didn't know any better, right? And so I've been right. doing a lot of reading and, and learning on how to improve on YouTube. And the creative writer in me wants to start out video descriptions uh, with, with, you know, the beginning of the story or something like that. But now that I'm starting to understand the SEO value of that description box in YouTube, I'm recognizing that I just need to shut up and get to the point. And then if I want to tell a nice story, you know, put that three paragraphs down because what's in that first, you know, what's, what's in those first couple of sentences in the description box is really what is going to provide the vast majority of the SEO value from from the YouTube algorithm standpoint. And so th it's it's hard to I mean, I'm having to basically create new habits, right? Where it's right. You, you do you cut out some of the fluff and the flowery flowery language and all that sort of stuff and just get to the point of what the thing is about and then bury that other stuff further down. Exactly. Since I started writing copy, I have been a huge student of copywriting because I was at a I started way back behind, you know, copywriters have been learning how to do this their entire careers, and I am way behind. So I was like, okay, how can I learn the most quickly? 
And so starting to consume copy, what you learn is that that's a never ending rabbit hole of learning. Yep. But one of the classes that I have taken recently uh, was, is taught by Marie Forleo and Laura Belgray. Marie Forleo is a huge influencer and teacher of entrepreneurs. Yep. She's wonderful. And Laura Belgray is a copywriter. She's written for network TV. She writes a fantastic uh, email news. I, it's, I guess it's a newsletter uh, type of thing. She She's big on emails. If you want to just read good emails, go to Laura Belgray. Uh, she runs a company called Talking Shrimp. Then you can go to TalkingShrimp.com and sign up for her network. I am not an affiliate. I just like the way she writes. But anyway, they teach about the corner position that every real estate agent knows that the best house is on the corner that you want to be i guess corner positions only have potentially two sides of neighbors instead of four sides of neighbors or three yep uh so you want to be somewhere where people are going to see you first uh, and the corner position in a paragraph or sentence is at the beginning okay makes sense it, it's also true with the entire copy so think about the corner of the sentence think about the corner of the paragraph but also think about the corner of the page. So lots of us start our about page and we start with where we started, right? Yep. Because that's, well, that's the beginning. And lots of stories start that way. It's logical. But if you start your story with the end, really, with the punchline, yep. Lynn is a fantastic explainer video. She started explaining technology to business users before she even knew what an explainer video was. Then you can get to the sentence first of yep. Lynn's the best and then move to why and st and tell the story later. So it's a flip of everything. Yes. That's what I've been learning with the YouTube side of things. And it, it really does. It forces you to put a lot more thought. Like I've always been that guy that I just sit down and start writing. And right. I, I can't be that guy if I want to try to get SEO value out of my YouTube videos. I can't be that guy that just sits down and writes a description. I need to really think about what is the point of this video? What is it that people are likely to be searching for that I want them to be able to find this video? How do I write that first and then put some of the other stuff later on? Like it really does force you to be strategic in how you approach all of this, which Absolutely. is it's hard. But you know what's great is that the more you do the outline first, the faster you'll get at it. It's just so, building a habit, right? It's creating right. a new habit. So if you start with outlines, when you're you're going to build a web page, and let's say you only have one demo, so you have one genre page, and the next year you do really well, and now you have four demos because you want to expand. And so now you want to focus your marketing in three more areas, three new genre pages. You're not going to just sit down and start spewing out genre information. You want to plan that page. Outline the page. I'm going to start with, you know, an above the fold paragraph that's engaging, that gives a bunch of great information, but has the hook, is is engaging enough for humans that they stay. And then I'm going to bury the rest of it under a read more button. So they fall down the page, the rest of it, not as important, but still lots of copy. Yep. Lots of people do this so that they don't overwhelm their reader with pages of words right. before they get to a demo. Yep. So above the fold, short, engaging, hooked paragraph, then read more button, all this other great stuff. What are my headers of each one of those sub paragraphs? What great keywords can I put in those headers? Because Google searches there first to get people to find my website, to help my SEO. So there's lots of, once you are writing strategically and thinking about the content, then you can pepper in the rules like, ooh, the subheader needs a keyword in it. And I can do that because I know this paragraph is about my business and my uh, collaboration tools. So if this paragraph is about my collaboration tools, I can say, you know, remotely connect anywhere in the world with Lynn and then talk about it. So if someone's saying, I need a voiceover remote, yep, they can find you. Wow. Man, you really do have to think through some of this stuff and how you want to write it all out. Yeah, I think that perspective, though, of um, when you sit down to think about your website, 
uh, your words are, your demos are super important. Your image, either your logo or your avatar or your picture, if you're using your picture. I think most of us use pictures these days because, again, that no like, and trust yep. factors in. But if you're not using a picture, that's okay. But you need to explain who you are with words. But you can't just sit down to write. And that's the difference between... I, I've never written a book, but I would imagine when writers sit down to write, they at least know the outline of the story. Yep. What's it about? Who are the main characters? Where am I going to take my reader? And then they write. But that outline helps them move through that writing faster. For sure. So you did touch on this. I mean, well, I want to dive into this. You, you mentioned pictures because we've been talking a lot about the writing as far as the actual written copy on your website. What about pictures. What well, can we do beyond just uploading the image? Right. So if you're not maintaining your own website, then you're going to need your webmaster to tag those photos. If you are maintaining your own website, then there are ways that, you, that you'll that you be able to find. Karen and Joe built mine. So I use the WordPress web designing in the background. So I know where to find the images. And then there's a, literally a description line that you type in keywords into. So there, no one cares about whether that's information that's legible to a human. No human's going to read it. So it just needs to have my name, my business name, what the genre is, any keywords that I want that image to be associated with when Google organizes the data on my page. Because Google is not going to say, oh, there's a picture of Lynn. It's going to say image. And if there are no tags associated with that image, then all they know is that's an image. They don't know anything else about right. what is that image. But when if people know my name, but they don't know my website, and they want to find me, so they Google my name, I want every single image, video, audio, anything I can tag with my name so that there are more iterations of my name on the page than I would use in copy. Lynn Norris is this, and Lynn Norris does that, and Lynn Norris likes this, is really horrible copy. I might use my name once on a genre page. I might not even use my whole name on the genre page, assuming they know my last name because they're on my website. But everywhere that no human is going to read it, like tags on images and tags on videos, I want to put my name so that when someone searches Lynn Norris, they find me. That's so smart. And that's something that is... I mean, everything else that we've talked about here, some of it probably feels really intimidating, particularly the people who aren't writers or, sure. you know, don't want to write. But going back through and just simply adding your name and your business name into image description tags on, I mean, that's something that any of us could go and start working on tomorrow. That's, sure. that's a relatively easy thing that you could do. And my understanding is that there is a lot of SEO juice in that, especially if you've got a lot of images on your website. Now, do the tags need to be, does the algorithm distinguish whether or not the tags are relevant to the image? I'm trying to think of how to, like, if I have a, I don't know, let's just say I've got a, a page for documentary narration on my on my website and the, the image is like a shot from a documentary. I don't know, it's a mountain scene or something. I don't know, I'm just spitballing mm -hmm. here. But yeah. so if I put... Mark Scott voiceover, does the algorithm see, well, what is it? What does this mountain have to do with Mark Scott voiceover? Like, does it ask that question or does it matter? It just, uh, it's seeing my name and my business and that's good. It can't see pictures. So it doesn't know. It knows it's a picture, but it doesn't know what it's a picture of. If that's wrong, I apologize, apologies to SEO experts, but I am 99% <laughs> sure that it does not know what that picture is. Perfect. It only knows that it's a picture. So in that case, yes, be super strategic about what you tag it with. I have a page for audiobooks and uh, a section where I have these little tiles that spin that give you a link to be able to go to Audible and buy the book. But on the front of that tile is the cover, unless I don't have the cover yet and then it says coming soon. But otherwise, it's the, the cover and the picture. Those images, when they get uploaded, all get tagged with... Lynn Norris, audiobook, the title, the style. If it's a romance, it gets that. So words that relate to that particular cover, sort of, but also that will help if someone's looking for Lynn Norris, audiobook narrator, romance. 
This is something that we can all do. Yes. This one of everything that you've told me, uh, some of the stuff that we were talking about earlier, I could, I was like starting to sweat. I'm like, nope, this is too hard. (laughs) This one, I'm like, no, I could totally go in and tag some images. This one's not so bad. So this is something like this is one of the easy tips that any of us, regardless of our expert abilities or inabilities or whatever, we could go and do this. So then if we're not writing a blog and we have no interest in writing a blog. Right. We've talked about pictures, which is good. Are there any other basic things that a voice actor could go in and do just to add even a little bit of SEO value to a, a, even a basic website? Well, what I do, because Google likes growth, but it doesn't have to be daily growth and shouldn't be daily growth because you're going to burn out quickly. Blogs, Paul writes every day. So that's a different story. So setting blogs aside for a minute, if you just have genre pages or just an about page, just it's a one, you know, business card website where it's just one page, you scroll down. And so there's an about section. I would suggest that you rewrite it, change it, update it once a year twice a year not very often but just so that the website's not sitting fully stagnant right exactly yeah that's another going back to blogs for a second if you're going to write a blog but you're not consistent or you're slow at writing them or you give up because it's hard to do and you've only written a few of them take the dates off so that humans don't look at it and go oh they haven't written on this website in four years they must not be doing this work anymore even if you're doing it every single day, you don't want to ever give the impression that you stopped. Maybe change the headers on the page to say interesting articles so that these were just articles that you wrote. Right. You weren't trying to write a blog. Right. You know, uh, so that people don't see that you gave up. Crap. I totally have to go back and do this right now. Because <laughs> as soon as you said it, I was like, oh, man, I know all of my blogs have dates attached to them. And I haven't written a new blog since 2018. Now I got to go back and figure out how to do that. <laughs> Well, or just put a note on your blog page that says, uh, hey, you haven't heard from me in a while. Here are my earlier thoughts. But if you want to hear from me now, go to Veopreneur. Yeah, because I transitioned it to the I put the I put the focus on the podcast. Right. So then write a note at the top of that page that tells them that. And then if you want to read my earlier thoughts before the podcast existed, scroll down. There you go. Now you don't have to change any dates. And you've explained to a human that you are very much still in this. I mean, most people who find you do that. (laughs) Oh, I have lots of homework assignments. Uh, What I have told people that I've been working with, if you go to my website, you're going to see a lot of things that like, well, she told me that 300 words isn't enough, but this one page has 300 words. Yes, it does. And that's okay. But eventually it'll have more because I'm going to change it because Google likes growth and I don't write a blog. So... 300 words is okay. And if you can only come up with 300 words, come up with 300 words. I was going to say, I know you said the sweet spot was kind of like 8 to 1,200, right? But, right. But 300 is better than zero. Yes. One is better than zero. Yeah. But try to get try to get to 500 if you can. But honestly, if all you can think of is 300, get it up there. Eventually, you'll find new ways to describe yourself. The more you write, the more you'll get better at it. I just haven't now revisited my own website because I'm busy writing and helping other people with theirs. But yes. So is that something where if you wrote 300, because that's all you could come up with. Right. Six months down the road, you're like, okay, you know what? Here's another two. And and you, you add another 200 to it. And now you're continuing to put new content up. You've just refreshed a page that hadn't been updated for a while. So, I mean, it's one of those those things things where anything is better than nothing, right? Absolutely. Okay. And you're not... This isn't a writing assignment because you're going to be graded, because, you know, if you don't write perfectly, no one will buy your voiceover. None of those things. Take that pressure away from yourself. You're writing to explain your business. You're not writing to get people to, you know, understand who you are at the depth of your soul. So you don't, it doesn't have to be that revealing. You're talking about your business. But again, you want people to know, like, and trust you. So be open enough so that someone can do that. Yeah. It's a lot to take in. But I know <laughs> I know that you help voice actors with this. So tell yep. us a little bit about the services that you are offering 
to voice actors and how we can connect with you if somebody wants to take advantage of those services? Well, I um, have been doing some group workshops. There's a workout group in Boston I just did one for, um, so I'm happy to do that. I'm going to be teaching for LiveO Takeover in March, so look out for that information and please come join and, and participate in that. You can also reach out to me directly at lynn at voicedbylynn.com. Um, I am starting to offer uh, an hourly coaching for people uh, to either help them strategize with what to, how to write a blog, what to do, and kind of get them thinking and organizing their thoughts, or to sit down with copy they've already written and help them see where to improve it. Um, sometimes it's not much to improve. Sometimes people are doing a great job and they just need to know that they're doing a great job. So just to have a second set of eyes read it and go, yeah, okay, tell me more. Do you do any kind of audits? Like if I wanted you to look at my website and you would go through and say, okay, here's five areas where you could tweak this or, you know, improve that or whatever. Like, do you do anything like that or? Uh, yes, okay. <laughs> certainly. I haven't. But, uh, but yes, I agree. yes, absolutely. I can help with that, too. I find that most of the people that I'm working with so far are um, still either in the planning stages or or are just starting to grow their website. Um, but if you have an established website and you're like, hey, OK, how can we judge this up a little? Then, yeah, absolutely. Go in and say, OK, I love this. Why don't we take this great copy and just change the position of it a little, zhuzh up some corner spots and uh, and then change these headers. Let's put some new, fresh keywords in them. What do you want to rank for? That's a good question to ask yourself yep. as a business, by the way. What words do I want to rank for? It can't be every word in voiceover. It's like if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. Yep. Pick a few. What do you want to rank for? This is where figuring out what your right. kind of where your niche area, your unique value, your unique value proposition so that you can kind of decide this is, you know, these are the areas that I'm going to go after. Because if you're just going after generic, even generic voiceover, voice actor, whatever, like you're going to lose before you even get started. Right. So, well, the more specific you, you may be, work, you may work. Sure. But you might be on page 40 of the Google results. And so you're going to work because you have to do all this extra work to direct market. Yeah. And your, your website's not going to work for you. That's yeah. the only bad thing, really. There's no bad things if you're bad at copy. No world doesn't end. It's just that if you want to have more avenues for people to find you, then getting good at copy is the way to do it to make your website a tool that works for you instead of just a place your mom visit it, visits to listen to your demos. Right. My mom visited my website a, a lot at the beginning. <laughs> there you go. So the website is voicedbylynn.com. Yep. And if you're looking for some help, because I'm sure that, I mean, I'm already, like I said, I feel overwhelmed by so much of this, which is why I think it's, there are certain things that are just better left to the experts. Yeah, there are a few basic things here and there that, that somebody like me could do. Definitely going back and looking at my image tags and things of, of that nature, but some of the other stuff, it's just like, no, it just, it just stresses well, me out just thinking about it. So we need people like you that can help us figure some of this stuff out. So if you right. need a little bit of help with the SEO side from the writing standpoint and, and, you know, creating those genre pages and things like that, which can make a big difference, it's nice to know that there's somebody out there who can help us. And because you're a voiceover artist, you're, you're in the industry, so you bring that perspective to the work that you're doing as well. Right. I believe in teaching people to fish. So yep. that they can eat for a lifetime. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. All right. You can't. Everyone can learn to do this. I promise. There you go. You heard it here first. So the website, Voiced by Lynn, I'll throw that up in the show notes. You can check that out if you want to get in touch with Lynn and talk to her about some of these classes that she's got coming up or uh, maybe maybe booking a coaching session with her or whatever. Uh, there you go, Lynn. Thank you so much. I mean, there's a there's a lot to unpack in this interview, but definitely some steps that any one of us, regardless of our level of expertise, can take even even now to start slightly improving our SEO and every little bit helps. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I appreciate you. Well, thank you very much for having me. I was happy to do it. Did that feel a little overwhelming to you? Maybe a little bit intimidating? I know it did for me, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. This is one of the reasons why I think that SEO is one of those tasks on your to-do list that should probably be left to the experts because there's so much to know and 
Just when you think you've started figuring it out, Google will go and change the rules, and then you're starting over from scratch anyway. You know, there are things that only you can do in your business, right? Only you can go in the booth and record your voiceovers. But there are things in your business that other people could do for you. And the more that you get other people to do those things for you, the more time that frees you up to do the things that only you can do. So outsourcing SEO, not necessarily a bad idea. And somebody like Lynn, who works in our industry, somebody who you can know, like, and trust, is certainly someone who could help you figure a few of these things out. I know that I've got some homework to do. I'm definitely going to be going back and looking at image tags. And I got to do that across multiple websites as well. But so many things to learn, so much to understand, but so much great advice as well. Every little bit helps when you're trying to put yourself out there and you're trying to get found. It's all part of your overall marketing strategy. And I'm grateful to Lynn for all of the information that she shared. If you learned something, would you let us know? Post it in your Instagram stories and tag me, at Mark Scott, and tag Lynn, at Norris Lynn, and let us know what you learned. Let us know that you're listening. Let us know that you enjoy the episode, and I'll put that information in the show notes so you'll be able to find it easily as well. Hope that you enjoyed it. Hope that you picked up a few things. Good luck with your SEO and trying to figure out what are the keywords that you want to be found for and how can you get more of those incorporated into your website. Thanks so much for listening. I'll catch you on the next one. The Everyday Veopreneur Podcast. Available everywhere fine podcasts are given away for free. Mostly, we think. Having your voiceover demos easily playable and downloadable on your website is essential. The VoiceAM player lets you do that across any device and browser. There are also options for adding play buttons in your email signature, tracking your listens, and even putting videos in your demo player. Sign up now at voicesam.com slash Mark Scott and receive an instant $25 credit. For full details and to claim this offer, visit voicesam.com slash Mark Scott. And scene. And that's a wrap. Thanks for hanging in. Thanks for hanging out. Want more Vopreneur goodness? Jump online at vopreneur.com. <laughs>